This video is sponsored by Incogni. More on them in a minute. I don't know about you, but it feels like we've been covering a lot of pretty heavy stories around here lately. And I, for one, could definitely use a palate cleanser of sorts. That's why today we've decided to take a trip back to the stranger, dumber, and just downright sillier side of true crime. Specifically, we're going to be looking at seven cases where suspects just did not think things through. Also, I know this is a bit strange considering this will be like the third video I've done on camera now, but what do you all think of the whole new setup? It's funny, I feel like I had so much going on in my head as we were preparing all of this that when the time actually came, we never directly addressed the studio itself. So yeah, what do you think? Personally, I'm having a lot of fun so far. As always, be sure to let us know what you thought of today's video in the comments section below. Well, I think we can all agree that dumb crime stories are pretty amusing. You want to know something that's not funny? Robocalls. Luckily, the sponsor of today's video, Incogni, is here to help. Listen, I might only be in my early 30s, but I'm old enough to reminisce about the times when the only people who had your cell phone number were people that you actually gave it to. Sadly, those days are long gone, and every week it seems like I'm getting more and more robocalls to the point where now I don't even pick up my phone most times if the person calling isn't already in my contacts. Even then, I'm left with a ton of annoying scam messages telling me that Canada Revenue is on their way to arrest me if I don't buy iTunes gift cards or something and send them directly to an international call center owned by cybercriminals. While it can be fun to laugh at some of these more obvious scams, the thing is, not all criminals are this unsophisticated. For example, there's the so-called Hi Mom text scam that's emerged in the last year or so, where scammers target parents by pretending to be their children and telling them that they need help. It's seriously scary stuff. Unfortunately, these scams are just one part of a bigger problem. That problem being that it's never been easier for our personal data to be collected and exploited online. In fact, there's a whole industry devoted to this. The companies that do this are what's known as data brokers. These data brokers find and compile our personal information and then sell it to anyone who wants to buy it. And not just your name and date of birth, either. I'm talking about your employment history, information about your finances and shopping habits, even your social security or social insurance number. The entities buying this data could simply want to annoy you with endless junk mail and advertising, or they could be people with more nefarious intentions people like stalkers or identity thieves. While you do have the right to protect your privacy and request that data brokers delete the information they have about you, traditionally, this has been easier said than done. For starters, these companies make themselves purposely hard to track down, and there are hundreds, if not thousands of them. Even if you do manage to contact them, you're still left with the daunting task of manually reaching out to each one. All the while, new companies are still collecting your data all the time. If this sounds like a losing battle, that's because it is. But it doesn't have to be. That's where Incogni comes in. Incogni reaches out to data brokers on your behalf, sending requests to have your information removed from their databases. The amazing part is that all of this is automated and done in three easy steps. One, create an account. Two, grant them the right to work for you. And three, sit back and watch them take care of everything. They handle the tedious requests, they fight with the companies if they try to object, and they keep a continuous watch for any new data brokers trying to take advantage of your personal information for as long as you have your account. Honestly, the entire process could not be easier. I just signed up a couple of days ago, and Incogni already identified and sent off removal requests to 46 different data brokers, 14 of which have been completed so far. Also, I haven't gotten any robocalls since then, so hey, seems to be working. If you're interested in trying Incogni for yourself, copy the information on screen or simply click the link in the description below. As an added bonus, Incogni has generously agreed to give 60% off to the first 100 people to use the code CRIMEZONE at checkout. Head on over now to take back control of your digital privacy. Thanks, Incogni. On the morning of July 9th, 2013, 33-year-old Anthony Thomas thought he'd hit the jackpot. He had made a trip to his local Sitco gas station and was preparing to leave the little convenience store when he noticed that the cash register had been left open and unattended. 
Evidently deciding that the opportunity was too good to pass up, Anthony double-checked to make sure no employees were watching before helping himself to a wad of bills in the register. After stuffing the cash into his pants, he walked out, making off with about $130. Now, already there were a couple of reasons why this wasn't the greatest idea. For starters, Anthony was apparently a regular at the gas station and bought cigarettes from there all the time. Also, the gas station had surveillance cameras, which had caught him in the act, though admittedly the footage was pretty grainy. Neither of these things ended up really mattering, though, because there was one way bigger thing that Anthony had failed to consider. The reason he had come to the gas station in the first place that morning was to fill out a job application. That's right, he walked in, handed over all of his contact information, and then decided to rob the place. Understandably, it wasn't very difficult to piece together what had happened once the gas station employees noticed that the register was empty. They called the police, who quickly tracked Anthony down and placed him under arrest. According to reports from the time, most of the stolen cash was found on his person, and he was subsequently charged with burglary, petty theft, and resisting arrest with violence. While we unfortunately weren't able to find any updated reporting about the case, one thing seems fairly certain. Anthony did not get that job at the gas station. More than any other type of crime, robbery is generally associated with wearing disguises. This can range from the classic ski mask or stocking over the head to more elaborate get-ups involving fake wigs, facial hair, and other costume pieces. However, the intent is pretty much always the same. Hide your identity and confuse any potential witnesses. Of course, there is one fatal flaw with the whole disguise concept that rarely, if ever, gets mentioned. That's the fact that you actually have to be wearing your disguise when you commit the robbery in order for it to work. This is apparently something that 35-year-old Florence L. James Jones learned the hard way. It all started on the night of April 27, 2015, when Jones went to the Rice Street Casino in Sioux Falls, South Dakota with the alleged intention of robbing the place. In order to pull off the crime, the 35-year-old had put on a pair of gloves, a baseball cap, and sunglasses, and brought with him a bag to store the money he planned to steal. The look would be completed by a plastic mask, which was large enough to cover the vast majority of Jones's face. Or at least it would have been, had he used it properly. You see, for some unknown reason, when Jones walked into the casino at around 10.45 p.m., he wasn't wearing the plastic mask. Instead, he decided to wait to put the most important piece of his disguise on until he was already inside the casino. You know, when he was being filmed by the building's cameras. The casino worker that Jones walked up to, on the other hand, immediately noticed his screw-up, to the point that when he arrived at the desk where she was working, still fiddling with his mask and demanding cash, she replied, You've got to be kidding me. You're on camera. Apparently unwilling to accept that he had completely botched the robbery attempt, Jones went into negotiation mode, at one point pulling out the bag he had brought and still trying to get some cash. When this failed, the 35-year-old made things even worse for himself, taking off the mask and allowing the cameras to get an even better view of his face before claiming the entire thing was a joke and fleeing the scene. When Sioux Falls police put out a clip of the casino's surveillance footage, they received a flood of tips identifying Jones almost immediately. It turned out that the 35-year-old was a former professional indoor football player for the local Sioux Falls Storm, so plenty of people knew who he was. He was charged with robbery, as well as possession of a controlled substance because of a small amount of methamphetamine that was found in his vehicle. According to inmate records, it appears that Jones has been in and out of jail since this incident for similar crimes and was also no stranger to police back in 2015, either. Over the years on this channel, we've covered a lot of stories about people's botched attempts to hire hitmen. Almost all of these cases follow the same predictable pattern. Somebody wants somebody else murdered, so they start asking around, one of these people inevitably tips off the police, and then the suspect ends up getting arrested after failing to realize the supposed contract killer they've been set up with is actually an undercover officer. However, there's one story that we recently came across that adds a refreshingly stupid twist to all of this. When we heard it, 
we knew that we had to share it with you. It all started sometime in early 2019, when a 52-year-old mother and her 20-year-old daughter went to file a police report in the Spanish city of Madrid. The pair said that they wanted authorities to investigate the mother's boyfriend because he had recently cheated them out of 60,000 euros, or about $65,000 US. The exact way that the mother and daughter were allegedly cheated is unclear, but it seems that police weren't able to deal with the situation to the pair's satisfaction. Deciding that the official route was getting them nowhere, that's when the mother and daughter apparently enlisted the help of another person, the daughter's 29-year-old boyfriend. The boyfriend said that he was more than up to the task of solving the women's financial woes. After all, he was a high-ranking agent with the Spanish intelligence service. He boasted that he had completed 352 missions, 349 of which were successful. He had earned 49 medals, shot down nearly 1,900 enemy targets, and was a skilled expert with firearms, suspect interrogations, and various forms of martial arts. Oh yeah, and he also spoke 22 languages, including Bengali and Hawaiian. You know, for all that super secret Spanish spy work that happens in the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah, so if it wasn't already obvious, these so-called credentials were bullshit. However, the mother and daughter completely bought into all of it. I'll give them a tiny bit of credit though here, because it really does sound like the boyfriend went the whole nine yards with this secret spy story, creating fake resumes and documents to show them. Anyway, the boyfriend told the women that he knew a foolproof way to get their money back. He would get an associate to kidnap and kill the mother's former partner, and then would arrange for his organs to be sold, which should easily cover that 60,000 euros. The mother and daughter were allegedly into this idea, so the boyfriend drafted a whole bogus contract where he laid out the terms. Part of it was that the women would agree to give him a down payment of 7,000 euros, you know, just to get the whole murder slash organ harvesting scheme rolling. The only thing was though, as soon as they gave the boyfriend the money, he disappeared. You know, because it had all been a con from the beginning. As for the mother and daughter, they were now in a pretty tight spot. They had lost even more money than before, and it's not like they could turn the boyfriend in for failing to carry out the very illegal plan they had cooked up together. Oh no, wait, that's exactly what they did. Several months after signing the bizarre murder slash organ harvesting contract, the mother and daughter went back to police saying that they had been swindled again. It's unclear what they expected to happen next. I mean, it's not like police were going to offer them a 30-day money-back guarantee because their hitman failed to deliver. Instead, though, they were arrested, as was the boyfriend, who pretended to be a secret agent. Unfortunately, it was difficult to find any more information about the case from here, since none of the names of those involved were released in any of the reporting we found in 2019. The reports do mention, though, that the whole ordeal was given a fitting name by police at the time. Operation Kafka. While every person on today's list failed to think things through in some way, the situation is extra embarrassing for the subject of this next story because there arguably wouldn't have been a crime at all had she just waited a moment to figure out what was actually going on. The whole thing unfolded one day in January of 2021 when a woman identified only as Leonora N was at home in the municipality of Cajem, located in the Mexican state of Sonora. She was having what was by all accounts a quiet day, until for some reason she decided to go through her husband Juan's phone. As she was scrolling, she came across something that made her blood boil. It was photos of Juan. Let's just say he was getting pretty physical with a young woman she didn't recognize. Immediately flying into a full-blown rage at this apparent betrayal, Leonora grabbed a knife and went to confront her husband. Upon finding him, she didn't wait for an explanation. She just started stabbing. Caught completely off guard by the attack, Juan took several knife wounds to the arms and legs before finally managing to wrestle the weapon away from his wife. Upon asking her why she had tried to kill him, it soon became clear what had happened. It turned out that Juan wasn't cheating on Leonora. The pictures she had seen were old photos they had taken together when they were still dating. Juan had recently stumbled across them in an old email and added them to his phone. Leonora apparently hadn't recognized herself 
because she was thinner, younger, and wearing more makeup. Police soon arrived at the couple's home and placed Leonora under arrest after neighbors reported hearing the commotion coming from their house. According to local media sources from the time, police were planning to lay charges against Leonora following their investigation. On July 8, 2003, a man named Albert Bailey robbed a branch of the People's United Bank in the city of Bridgeport, Connecticut. After walking into the bank, Bailey handed a teller a large empty envelope as well as a note demanding $50,000 in cash. He then pointed to a large bulge in his pants, explaining that, no, he wasn't just happy to see them, he had a bomb. While Bailey managed to get some of the money he demanded, the second he walked out of the bank, he was arrested by police. In his pocket, they found his so-called bomb, which turned out to be nothing more than a random assortment of circuit boards and wires. Though this was Albert Bailey's first foray into bank robbery, it wouldn't be his last. You see, almost immediately after getting out of prison seven years later, he was ready to try it again. Bailey put his second plan into motion on March 23, 2010. He was going to hit a second People's United Bank branch, this one in the city of Fairfield, only this time he was sure that he had thought of everything. The now 27-year-old made a detailed robbery checklist and had obtained a police scanner which he tuned to the same frequency as the Fairfield police. He had also enlisted the help of his 16-year-old cousin, whose job it would be to actually go and collect the money from the bank and whom he would communicate with during the heist via a walkie-talkie. Determined not to go down like last time, Bailey had thought of one final component to his plan. He would make sure that by the time he went to rob the bank, the money was already prepared, allowing them to flee the scene more quickly. How was he going to make sure the money was already, you ask? Oh, by calling ahead of time, of course. Yeah, that's right. This guy called in a bank robbery like it was a f***ing to-go order. If for some reason the problem isn't already obvious here, allow me to explain what happened next. At around 2.40 that afternoon, Bailey called the People's United Bank, informing them that he would be there in 10 minutes to rob the place. During this call, he said, quote, I want $100,000 in large bills and no die packs. I will be sending someone into the bank to get the money. Don't call the police. We are monitoring the police scanner. Do you understand? He also stated several times that he wasn't afraid to take hostages or to, quote, turn the place into a bloodbath. By the time Bailey's cousin walked inside, the money was indeed ready for him. However, so were the police, who bank employees had called immediately after they got off the phone with Bailey. As soon as the 16-year-old headed outside and went for the getaway car, two things happened. First of all, the die packs that the bank employees had put in the money exploded, because of course they were still going to put them in there, and both he and Bailey were swarmed by police officers. A few months later, Bailey once again pleaded guilty to robbery, as well as being a persistent dangerous felony offender and harassment. We weren't able to find out what his sentence was, however, reports from the Times say he was facing up to nine years in prison. Though it was stated that Bailey's cousin was placed in juvenile detention, no additional information was released about his legal proceedings since he was a minor at the time. If you had asked me a week ago to name a sport with a lot of cheating scandals, the first thing to come to mind definitely would not have been the competitive bass fishing circuit. Of course, I don't know anything about sports in general, so maybe this isn't news to anyone but me. But apparently, yeah, there's a lot of cheating in the world of bass fishing. So much so that professionals and amateurs alike routinely have to agree to submit to polygraph tests during competitions as a way to prove their catches are legit. According to reports, cheating is not only extremely common in these contests, it's also extremely hard to catch. This makes things complicated when you consider that there are often big cash payouts and prizes awarded to winners, meaning that there's a real incentive to cheat because there's a good chance you'll probably get away with it. Well, most of the time, anyway. Enter the subject of this segment, a 45-year-old Texas man named Robbie Rose. According to an article from ESPN, Robbie got his start in professional bass fishing in 1997. Over the next seven years, he would enter 21 events in the Bassmaster circuit, 
though he was far from a notable name. He never finished higher than 54th place, and his average winnings were less than $32 per tournament. After failing to hack it in the big leagues, Robbie dropped back down to the amateur circuit. However, it was here where his luck suddenly appeared to turn around. He ended up winning the Bass Champs Tournament at Cedar Creek in 2007, and that year raked in $120,000 at various competitions. It wasn't long, though, before Robbie's stunning reversal of fortune started to raise some eyebrows. That tournament he had won? It turned out that it was a team event, yet somehow Robbie had beaten everyone else fishing solo. This wasn't a minor outperformance, either. Robbie had crushed the competition. All but one of the 234 teams in the tournament had failed to reach the limit of five fish each, yet Robbie claimed to have caught five bass single-handedly. That's when the allegations of cheating started. Now, apparently, there are a lot of different ways you can cheat at bass fishing, but the most common method is reportedly a technique called staking. Basically, what you do is you catch your fish ahead of time and put them in a wire mesh cage, which is then tied to a branch or stake. The fish are then retrieved from the water during the tournament and passed off as a live catch. It was this method that Robbie was accused of using. The accusations against the 45-year-old continued to mount until finally officials with the Bass Champ series were forced to intervene. They told Robbie that if he wanted to continue competing, he'd have to fish with an observer in his boat. Realizing he had been caught, Robbie promptly moved on to other tournaments. Still, even at other events, Robbie could sense that the heat was on, so much so that when he entered the Bud Light Trail Lake Ray Hubbard Big Bass Tourney in the spring of 2010, he knew he would have to change up his technique. Unfortunately for him, the solution he came up with wasn't exactly subtle. Because he could no longer ensure that he had the best fish ahead of time using the staking method, Robbie opted to try and make the average fish he caught seem more impressive. He did this by getting his bass to swallow a one-pound lead weight he had brought with him, which he then turned in for evaluation. Things went sideways fairly quickly. Before Robbie could even do his polygraph test, judges noticed something strange in the holding tank where the bass were being stored during weigh-in. Robbie's fish had completely sunk to the bottom of the tank, and the thing was clearly struggling. It wasn't hard to figure out why. It turned out that the fish weighed less than nine pounds, so that extra pound that Robbie had gotten it to swallow accounted for more than 10% of its total weight. I mean, seriously, you try eating more than 10% of your body weight in pure lead, and then go for a swim and see what happens. I wouldn't want to do it. So yeah, after being well and truly busted, Robbie admitted to what he had done and removed the weight from the fish. He was disqualified, However, that was soon the least of his worries. Because the top prize in the competition was a $55,000 boat, authorities saw the case as Robbie essentially trying to steal 55 grand. He was charged with attempted theft for more than 20,000 but less than $100,000 and ended up spending 15 days in jail and getting five years probation. He also lost his fishing license for the duration of his probation. Having never been involved in drug smuggling myself, I can't really claim to know the ins and outs of the business. That being said, if for whatever reason I decided to moonlight as a drug mule, I think I'd probably do the opposite of pretty much everything my fellow Canadian Jasmine Clare did back in 2012, when she inadvertently gave a one-woman masterclass on how not to keep a low profile. According to reports, it all started in December of that year, when Jasmine met two guys named Narinder Kaler and Gurjeet Sandhu through a friend at work in Surrey, British Columbia. The two men told Jasmine that they had a super easy way for her to make $4,000. All she had to do was go across the border into Washington State, pick up a package, and then get back as close to the border as possible. They would take care of the rest. Oh yeah, one minor thing. That package was 11 kilos, or about 24 pounds of cocaine. No biggie, right? Jasmine didn't seem to think so, and so on December 15th, she headed down to meet with Narinder and Gurjeet's contacts at a pizza hut in the city of Bellingham. At first, everything seemed to be going according to plan. Jasmine picked up the cocaine, then arranged a ride back to the room she had booked at a bed and breakfast in the city of Blaine. 
The bed and breakfast was conveniently located less than 150 feet from the Canadian border. Unbeknownst to Jasmine, though, someone tipped police off about her drug deal. And as it turned out, she had made some pretty unfortunate choices that made her all too easy for authorities to follow. For starters, there was that bed and breakfast she had chosen to stay at. Its name? The Smuggler's Inn. She had also called the owner of the bed and breakfast for a ride after her drug deal. It just so happened that his SUV had a vanity license plate that spelled out S-M-U-G-L-E-R. So yeah, the drug smuggler got a ride in the smuggler mobile to the Smuggler's Inn. Seriously, folks, you can't make this stuff up. Anyway, police were pretty much hot on Jasmine's tail from the moment the drug deal finished, and she was confronted after arriving back at the bed and breakfast. She immediately caved under questioning and allowed officers to conduct a search of the vehicle she was traveling in, where they found the 24 pounds of cocaine. She then agreed to help police catch Narinder and Gurjeet, who drove to the edge of the Canadian border a few hours later and tried to run across the yard of the Smuggler's Inn, where they were both arrested. Following the whole debacle, Jasmine, Narinder, and Gurjeet all agreed to plead guilty to crimes including conspiracy to distribute cocaine. Sources from the Times say that the three would have faced a minimum of 10 years in prison had they not taken plea deals, though were expected to get less time for their cooperation. Of all the stories on today's list, I would argue that this final one is far and away the best example of a criminal failing to think things through. Honestly, the first time I came across this one, I had to take a second to process the stupidity. The whole thing started in the fall of 2018, when a Florida man named Michael Johnson was contacted by an old acquaintance of his, 40-year-old Shane Anthony Mele. Mele said that he was in a rough spot, his wallet had just been stolen, and he didn't have a place to stay. Feeling bad for the man, Michael agreed to let him temporarily stay at his office in North Palm Beach. He also gave him some work to help him get back on his feet. Shane reportedly repaid Michael for his kindness by staying rent-free for approximately three months before ransacking the place one night and disappearing. As an added gut punch, before he took off, Shane stole most of Michael's coin collection. It was one that he had been working on since he was 16 and contained over 100,000 coins, many of which he had inherited from his late father. Not everything in the collection was worth tons of money, but there were a few coins that were pretty valuable. This included 33 $1 presidential coins that were worth $1,000 apiece. What did Shane do with this large score? I'm glad you asked. At first, he did what any ordinary criminal probably would have done. He took the stolen goods to a jewelry and valuable shop. However, for some inexplicable reason, after selling only a few, he changed tactics, deciding to dump the rest of the loot at Coinstar machines at local grocery stores. If you're not familiar with these machines, first of all, don't use them, they're a ripoff. But basically, you dump your change into them and they count it and spit out a receipt with the total. You can then redeem the receipt for cash, all for the high, high price of as much as 11.9% of your total, plus a 50 cent transaction fee. If you're following along with the math here, that means that when Shane exchanged the $33,000 worth of presidential coins, at best, he would have gotten the face value of 33 bucks. However, when we factor in deductions for Coinstar's transaction and service fees, he was probably left with about $28.57. As you might imagine, this money didn't get Shane very far, and before long he was arrested and charged with grand theft as well as some unrelated drug offenses. He was ultimately convicted and sentenced to five years in prison and was just released a couple of months ago at the time of this recording. According to inmate records, he's due to remain on parole until 2033. Before we wrap up, we'd just like to give a shout out to everyone who made it this far into the video. As always, we hope you found today's stories interesting and informative. A huge thanks as well to today's sponsor, Incogni. Don't forget to check out the link in the description below to save 60% on your subscription today using our code CRIMEZONE at checkout. If you're looking for additional ways to support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. 
You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you will also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. Once again, thanks so much, everyone, and take care. Thank you.